The concept of the road is one built out of necessity. It makes life easier by transporting people and goods on a designated route with efficient transit. That is, if you don't live in LA. It's amazing to think that a simple path that we walk, bike, and drive on went through numerous iterations throughout history and took literally thousands of years to perfect. Surely, something as simple as a road, really a dirt path, would have been made fairly early in human history. Actually, no. The idea of a dirt path likely came into the picture around 10,000 BC, at the beginning of the Neolithic Age. Even more so, the wheel wasn't discovered until 3,500 BC, 6,500 years later. But wait a second, Homo erectus was walking on two feet roughly two million years ago. Why did it take nearly 1.9 million years for the concept of a dirt path to happen? Well, that has to do with how early Homo sapiens lived. Early on, Homo sapiens were largely nomadic, hunting and gathering food in geographical areas where it was most advantageous, until resources became scarce and they moved on. In order for a road, or in this case a communal path to form, Homo sapiens would have had to reuse the same route numerous times. Being nomadic meant constantly moving around, never being in one location long enough to make repeated erosion in a local area. The only thing that would have dictated where nomadic Homo sapiens walked was the geographical landscapes they traveled through. Coastlines, rivers, and streams would have been the only thing closest to a walkway, offering some kind of direction to early Homo sapiens. Then, in the Neolithic Age, around 10,000 BC, humans began to farm, creating large groups of people living in non-nomadic settlements. As these settlements grew more crops and food, so did their population. Several of these settlements were distributed over a large geographic region, and eventually began to communicate and trade with each other. This repeated communication and trade between settlements created the dirt paths or early roads of the day. These early roads were exactly what you would expect them to be, dirt paths beaten down by repeated traffic from both humans and animals. These wouldn't be much different from a hiking trail you would find in the woods. Luckily for the progress of humanity, early humans began constructing trackways around 6000 BC. These trackways allowed for foot traffic into areas that were not ideal for walking, specifically in swamps and marshland. In what is now Plumstead, England, archaeologists discovered a wooden trackway that ran through an ancient marsh. Carbon dating determined it to be constructed sometime around 6000 BC. The trackways consisted of two pegs secured in an X formation in the ground, supported by a base in the middle. A plank for walking was anchored into the pegs with a wooden spike. It's believed marshes were a reliable source of food, as early humans could both hunt and fish wildlife in swamps. The trackways were built to make this much easier. As early humans began to farm, one of the best places to do so was the Fertile Crescent in modern-day Iraq. Villages grew into towns and towns into cities. Habitations expanded outward from the Fertile Crescent as far as Egypt along the Nile, which just happens to be the next place of a major advancement in road technology. Leave it to the culture that built these to also build a new advanced road. The construction of the pyramids at Giza had a direct relation to the improvement of roads in Egypt. The pyramids were a great idea on paper, but in reality were a logistic nightmare. Before Egyptian engineers figured out how they were going to stack 20 foot by 30 foot limestone blocks, they had to get them to the building site. And pushing a 400 ton limestone block through sand is like herding cats. Or rather, maybe it's just like pushing a 400 ton limestone block through sand. Anyways, this was not going to get the pyramids built in any pharaoh's lifetime. Something had to be done. Around 2400 BC, a utility road was built from a quarry where the limestone blocks were chiseled, to where the pyramids were being built. What was so special about this road? It wasn't a dirt road. I mean, we're talking about sand in the desert. It was technically the first paved road in history, though not like this. The seven and a half mile stretch was made of slabs of limestone, sandstone, and wood. This flat surface reduced friction and allowed logs underneath the blocks to roll much easier to the building site. Slab roads were a great improvement from the uneven dirt roads or sand in the Middle East. Not much would change for road ingenuity until the Romans got involved. The Roman Empire was an enormous multi-continental entity. It stretched from the coast of Portugal to the edge of modern-day Iraq. It didn't get this big by being really nice to nearby countries. The Romans were notoriously brutal in conquest and had an aggressive military. The Roman army owed much of its successful conquest to its roads. In order to mobilize legions of troops to enemy movements or quash a rebellion at the other end of an empire, an effective road system was paramount. Before the Romans, the most advanced roads were just dirt paths with some modifications on the surface layer. Nothing structural underground. 
This worked for civilian traffic, but not military traffic, carrying thousands of soldiers and heavy military equipment, like carabalistas and battering rams. Dirt roads were easily eroded by heavy loads, and mud-soaked roads were impossible to use. To make roads more durable for military transport, the Romans worked smarter, not harder. They developed an elaborate engineering system that would influence roads in Europe 1,200 years later. These roads were called Via Munita, translating to Roman Way. For Via Munita, a trench was dug the length of the road. The bottom layer of dirt was tightly packed down. Stones were laid over the bottom layer of dirt, followed by a layer of pulverized rocks and lime. A cement mixture made from crushed pottery and lime was poured over the rubble layer. Finally, rectangular rocks were used for the surface layer. Roads had drains built into the sides to avoid erosion and maintain road integrity. The Romans were on top of their game. Here's a cross-section of Roman road. Notice the big rocks on the bottom, followed by the different layers of cement and pulverized rocks in between, and the bricks on top. Roman roads were engineered so well that there's literally Wikipedia pages on them. Ancient Greek historian Dionysus of Halconarsus was very fond of Roman ingenuity, and once remarked, the extraordinary greatness of the Roman Empire manifests itself, above all, in three things. The aqueducts, the paved roads, and the construction of the drains. At the height of the Roman Empire, there was over 250,000 miles of road, 50,000 of which was stone-paved road. So all roads really did lead to Rome after all. The Roman Empire lasted a solid 503 years, from 27 BC to 476 AD. And with the end of the empire, came the end to really great roads. Europe was officially in the Dark Ages, and both art and technology went right out the window. However, in the Middle East, new road technology was being discovered. Middle Eastern engineers discovered that heating petroleum from oil fields produced a dark, heavy, thick residue. When this residue dried, it became very firm and resilient. This petroleum residue was tar. In 8th century Baghdad, road engineers coated their dirt roads with distilled tar, making the first paved roads in history. The method of paving roads, however, would only be known to the Middle East, as volumes of oil was needed to produce tar. Let's see what's going on in Europe. Oh right, the Dark Ages. After the Roman Empire fell, roads of Rome, much like the roads in western New York, fell into disrepair. Whatever kingdom inherited the roads did with them what they wanted, and with the unified empire no longer existing, no one really knew what they were doing. Alas, the knowledge of exquisite road building would be lost to the ages. Dirt roads became all the rage again. As Europe progressed into the Middle Ages, population density increased. Dirt and brick roads with only surface layer modifications sufficed for most urban areas. And armies became centered around castles, no longer needing well-built roads to transport thousands of soldiers. Luckily for humanity, the Renaissance was not far off. The Renaissance was a rebirth of interest in Greco-Roman art, architecture, and science. With this new interest in Greco-Roman culture came the knowledge of Roman road building. The first documented European application of Roman influence in road construction was in 1725. British Field Marshal George Wade built 250 miles of road in the Scottish Highlands, known as Wade's Military Roads. Wade used directions from Roman engineering texts. The purpose of the roads were to restore order in the region after the Jacobite rebellions of 1715. However, George Wade wasn't exactly keen on the Roman methods, and the roads turned out to be, well, the roads were so bad it was even remarked that they were as to be unfit for the purposes of civil life. What mattered most, though, was European engineers finally had an interest in building really good roads. And wouldn't you know it, after the Renaissance, the scientific revolution happened. <laughs> The Renaissance got Europe interested into road construction, but the scientific revolution gave them the tools to construct the roads. New understandings of physics from Galileo, Hooke and Newton, and mathematics from Napier, Leibniz, and also Newton, and of course applying the scientific method, engineers greatly improved their road building skills. In 1764, French engineer Pierre-Marie Jérôme Trezégout, widely regarded as the first true road engineer, applied a scientific protocol to road construction. He noticed a common problem. Roads would often fracture or deform from heavy loads passing over them, making them uneven and inefficient to use. Trezegu solved this problem by cooking up a design of different sized layers of rocks. The bottom layer consisted of large stones that acted as the strongest support. A layer of medium stones were laid upon the large stones, and smaller stones about the size of walnuts were laid atop the medium stones. The top surface of road was flattened and made smooth. 
When a heavy load would pass over, the weight would be spread across in multiple layers of stones, increasing the area of force put on the road, making them more resilient. The load would press into the small stones, which would then press into the medium stones, which would then press into the large stones. The 18th century would see numerous improvements to road design that had not been seen since the Roman Empire. English road builder John Metcalfe won a contract with the English government to construct a three-mile stretch of road, and is credited for reintroducing the convex surface design, which allowed rainwater to drain off the surface of the road instead of collecting in the middle. However, the most significant road design would come about by a Scottish engineer named John McAdam, who designed the predecessor to the modern road. In 1816, McAdam was appointed as surveyor for the Bristol Turnpike Trust, a toll collection entity in Bristol. As surveyor, McAdam set out to improve the roads under his jurisdiction. He made the road foundation out of soil instead of massive stones, asserting the soil already in place would support traffic, as long as the top layer had a firm crust to protect it from water leakage and traffic erosion. The surface layer that behaved as a firm crust was known as macadam, consisted of a single layer of crushed stones of small angular size and compacted tightly. A binding layer of dust made from pulverized stone was laid over the road and was rolled to keep the binder dust and stones together and flat. Macadam was obsessed with having exact sized stones in the macadam mixture. The lower macadam layer stones had to be no larger than 3 inches, and the above layer had to be exactly 2 inches. Macadam was so anal about stone size that he required supervisors to walk around with scales, measuring the size of stones before they were used to build roads. If they didn't have scales, Macadam suggested placing the stone in the worker's mouth. If it would fit, it could be used. If not, it was cast aside. How would workers obtain such size-specific stones? They would either collect them, usually near lake shores and quarries. If no small rocks were available, workers had to manually break and chip large rocks apart to make the required 2 and 3 inch large stones. Workers made the firm upper crust of the macadamized road by mixing the macadam aggregate with sand and clay to firm up the mixture and spread it on the road surface. This is what the final product of a macadam road surface looked like. Finally, in 1834, the precursor to the modern road was created. A road worker named Henry Cassell in London, England attempted to further bind up the macadam stone soil mixture. He laid a layer of tar on the road surface, then a layer of macadam, and a final layer of tar and sand on top. Cassell did not know it at the time, but he created the first instance of tarmac. Tarmac, however, was unpopular as traffic in the mid-19th century was not harsh enough to require a firm, solid surface. Horse and buggies were not as destructive as cars and trucks. It wasn't until the early 20th century when heavy motorized cars came on the scene that a firm, solid surface was needed. British engineer Edgar Hooley noticed that tar mixed with the macadamized road surface made it smooth, could handle vehicles traveling at high speeds, and kept dirt and dust down. Hooley patented the mixture in 1901. He then added cement and resin to it and used a steamroller to spread it out on the road surface, making an asphalt road, the final iteration of the road. Today, modern roads use heavily from both the macadam design and the tar macadam composition. John Macadam was correct in 1823 in stating that the natural earth below the surface would support the weight of traffic and that a firm resilient crust was needed to keep the road usable. Edgar Hooley's tar macadam composition was very similar to the asphalt that's used today, except that instead of rocks and sand that was used in tar macadam, asphalt is a mixture of petroleum-derived asphalt and gravel, which acts as a firm crust for the road surface. It's incredible to think that these simple paved roads we take for granted every day went through thousands of years of development and trial and error until they were perfect. In fact, they're so perfect that everyone uses them. Thanks for watching.